Hi everyone and welcome back to the shack. Now, one of the very first videos I did showed me building a brand new Spectrum based on one of these Harlequin boards by the awesome Superfo. I got the kit from Bike Delight and it was a really nice build, but is it really a Spectrum? I also got hold of one of these replacements for the membrane in a Spectrum Plus, and whilst it's a great idea, it's not particularly easy to align, so your mileage may vary. And of course, you're still using the Spectrum Plus keyboard, which again, you either love or hate. Anyway, I was having a good look around the PCB Way Shared Projects page, and lo and behold, the lovely Pab had created this replica of the Issue 3B Spectrum mainboard. So I got on the bat phone to PCB Way, and a few days later, this little package arrived with a few of them in. The plan? To build a brand new Issue 3B ZX Spectrum 48K mainboard using as many new parts as possible. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. So here's the board up close, and this board in black is a thing of beauty. I don't know what it is about PCBs, but I think they're a work of art even before they're populated. As part of this build, we're also going to be looking at giving the old Specky a proper mechanical keyboard using this board designed by Superfo again. And this is designed to take proper Cherry MX switches and keycaps and should give a really nice feel. Now, the only part I know I can't replace with a brand new one at the moment is the LM1889 chip, which is the TV video modulator. But other than that, there are brand new parts for everything else. It's taken me about three months to get all of the parts together as they've come in from China, Europe, the UK, and even as far away as New Zealand. I think I have everything I need, so it's time to warm up the soldering iron, get a really nice fresh cup of tea, and get started. Before we begin, it's good to take a close look at the board and make sure we understand where everything goes and it's all nice and clear. Just like any other board, we'll start with the shallowest components first and work upwards in height. So we'll begin with the resistors. Now, I tend to buy my resistors in multi-packs and not always from the same supplier. So whenever I'm opening up a new batch, I always like to test one to make sure that it's not been mispacked. So we'll just check using our multimeter and this should read 330 ohms. And yes, that looks there or thereabouts. Yes, before anyone shouts at me, I know I should print myself a leg bending guide for consistency, but I haven't, so you'll have to put up with me guessing and things being a little bit uneven. That looks okay, and after quickly rechecking the PCB layout to ensure I'm popping it into the correct slot, it's bend the legs a little so that it stays in place while the board is upside down, and quick bit of solder, all nice and tidy, snip the legs off, Yep, that looks lovely. And then it's rinse and repeat for all the other resistors. So that's nearly all of the resistors in place. And I say nearly because there were a couple of values that I didn't order as I thought I had them already, but no, I've had to order them in. Darn you pesky R31 and R55. I forgot to mention with the resistors that they don't have a polarity, so it doesn't matter which way round they go. And the same is true for our next components, these ceramic capacitors. Again, I tend to buy these from a variety of places, and whilst capacitors like this are clearly marked with their value, I always check to make sure I've not got a dodgy batch. This is a 473, so should be a 47 nanofarad capacitor. Putting it into my tester shows that to be the case. 
The spacing for the legs on these capacitors looks like it's more suited to the standard axial type, where the legs poke out of each end, like a resistor, rather than these, which have both the legs poking downwards. Never mind, we'll get creative with the leg bending and get all these soldered in too. I've got to say that soldering is one of the most relaxing and therapeutic things I do. I absolutely love it. Well, that all looks rather neat and tidy if I do say so myself. Okay, now we're on to the diodes. The orientation of these is normally shown by a line at one end of the component on the PCB, and this is the end that needs to have the white line, in the case of a normal diode, or a black line like here on this Zener diode. The line indicates the direction of the current flow, and there's a good few of these, so let's pop them in. Haven't got a D16 either. Doll. Oh. Next up, it's the transistors, and it's important to note that TR1 and TR2 are actually printed on the PCB in the wrong orientation. TR1 should be placed flat side north, and TR2 should be placed flat side south. With all of the transistors in place, we can turn our attention to the power delivery with the barrel jack, the voltage regulator and the coil. For this build, we won't be using a 7805 voltage regulator that was in the original design, even though they are available as a new part. We'll be using this TSR2450 switching regulator. It's much more efficient and doesn't give off any heat, and that's a good thing because we don't want to have a nasty old heatsink covering up this beauty when we're finished, do we? First we'll solder in the barrel jack, lots of solder, as this will get a lot of use. When soldering components like this, I like to solder one leg first, remove the tape and then press it in place whilst reflowing the joint. Then the part pops flush with the board and we can move on to the other joints knowing its level. Quickly pop in the voltage regulator. These are a direct replacement for a 7805, so it just slots in here. Last piece of the power rail is this coil. So we'll get this part in, and then I think it's time for a quick cup of tea before we get onto the repetitive bit, the sockets. So here we are, Socketville, and I'm using these turn pin sockets as usual. Now, for those of you out there in internet land who are shouting, why on earth are you using turned pin sockets? Just use leaf sockets. Then my friend, you are in for a treat in this video a little later on. In any case, let's get all of these in place. With sockets, I solder each diagonal corner first and then press each corner down while reflowing to get them nice and level. So on we go. Blimey, that didn't take long, did it? And it's always at this point I can see the finish line and get all excited. It does look very pretty though, doesn't it? I'm not sure what happened here, but I seem to have forgotten to film putting in the ear and mic socket, the keyboard connectors and the crystals. Sorry about that, but we'll pick up with fitting the electrolytic capacitors. I've got these nice blue ones because I wanted a bit of a contrast with the black PCB. Capacitors like this are polarised, and the arrow on the body of the capacitor always points to the negative lead. Bit of measuring and bending, 
and making sure we've got the polarity right, we'll pop these onto the board and splay the legs at the back to hold them in. Bit of solder, I'm using lead free Roycin solder with a flux core, snip off the legs and that's two down and a few more to go. Well, with all of the capacitors in place, we'll turn our attention to the jumpers on the board. We're setting these up like this, but that's not the same as a normal Issue 3 board. And there's a good reason for that, which we'll come to in a bit. And then we're on to the video output. And for this, we're going to be installing this S-Video board, which should give us a nice crisp picture. This kit came with a nice 3D printed separator for use in a normal spectrum, where you need to ensure there are no shorts against the exposed traces. We haven't got any exposed traces, but we'll use this anyway so the port lines up properly in the case. The two little screws need to make good contact with the vias on either side of the board and the PCB as this provides the ground for the circuit. Video output on the Spectrum is handled by this LM1889 chip, which is the only chip on the board that requires a 12 volt signal, and there's an entire power rail circuit dedicated to providing that for this chip. This is also the only chip where there's not a modern replacement, so we'll be careful with this. Wiring for S-Video is slightly different to the standard RF or a composite mod, as we have both Luma, the brightness of the video signal, and Chroma, the colour, to take into consideration. We'll take the Luma from where the usual signal comes in, and we'll take the Chroma from the positive end of C65. We'll remove C65 also, as that usually takes the Chroma signal to TR1 and TR2 to be mixed in with the Luma, and we don't want that. So with the video sorted, let's start popping in the other chips, starting with a brand new ULA replacement, the VLA82, which has winged its way from V-Retro in New Zealand. These aren't cheap, but are exceptionally well made and gorgeous looking too. Next up is our ROM, and we're using this also gorgeous selectable ROM, which I got from Retrolium. This has the standard 48K ROM in one bank and a diagnostics ROM in the other. We'll use that later to test everything works. Here's a brand new Z80. These are such versatile chips that they just don't seem to want to stop making them. Pop that in there along with all the new Logic chips. For memory, we're going to use these brand new SRAM based boards which are designed to directly replace the memory chips on a Spectrum board and as such should directly pop into the existing sockets. There's an upper RAM board as well and I got both of these from Retrolium also. And here's the part of the video that you Leaf socket fans will love. I couldn't get these RAM boards to fit into the turn pin sockets, believe me I tried. In the end, I decided to rip out all of the turn pin sockets for the memory and replace them with leaf sockets and then this memory slotted straight in. I guess there's just more tolerance in the fit on the leaf sockets. And we're done. The only parts which aren't brand new are the LM1889 as mentioned previously and I've had to borrow a speaker from another machine as even though these are available new, I forgot to order one. I have now and when it arrives, I'll replace this tatty old one. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that looks absolutely fantastic. So I guess we should see if it works. Right, let's plug in the S-Video cable and then hook up our nine volt center negative power supply. And hmm, we have a Spectrum running the Retrolium Diagnostics ROM, but it's in black and white. Hmm. Well, I checked the voltage being received by LM1889 because that needs 12 volts to operate. I was getting just over 8 volts, so that's not good. I traced back the voltage to these transistors here and decided to check them out. One of them was fine, but the other seemed to be acting as two resistors in series. So I changed that transistor out to see if it made any difference. And now the LM1889 is getting a 12 volt supply across pins 14, 15 and 16. So let's try again. And no, we still have no color. Hmm. Now I know that Crystal X2 provides the frequency for the color modulation. So I changed that to a different make of the same frequency and still nothing. 
I've checked that I have 5 volts to the S video board and that it's grounded. I have continuity from pin 13 on the LM chip to C65, so the signal is getting there. I've tried another LM chip and that made no difference. Now the kicker here is that when I took out the S-Video board, reinstated C65 and put a composite mod in instead, it was still black and white. It looks like this video is going to need a part 2, because we need to fix the colour issue and of course we still need to build that keyboard and then we need a nice modern case to put all of this in. So anyway, thanks for watching so far. I hope you'll join me in the next episode and if you have any idea of what could be causing this issue, please put them in the comments. You may just save me some time and my sanity. Right, where's my new microscope and oscilloscope? Late as everyone. <laughs>